So this morning, I would like to have a conversation about sleep. And ironically, I've been in the, U- in the U.S. this week, and I just got back yesterday. So maybe we will practice a little bit this morning. Let's open in prayer. Lord, thank you that we can come together this morning. Thank you for uh, guiding this conversation, for letting my words be from you, Lord, and that you would open our hearts and let us walk with you and learn and grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we might think that sleep is actually none of God's business and that while we're awake, We are walking with him, we are learning from him, we are in relationship with him, but when we're asleep, well, that's not really, I mean, that's just sleeping. It has nothing to do with God, it has nothing to do with our religion, our relationship with him. That may be kind of our default thought pattern. But I'd like to challenge that a little bit this morning. A third of our lives we spend sleeping. And so how can we abide with God? How can we continue in relationship with God when we're asleep? And how does that, what does that look like? So let's, usually, I don't think we talk about sleep a whole lot in church, but the Bible does uh, talk about sleep. And so let's explore that and see what it has to tell us. I heard a sermon not long ago by a man And he started off being very frank. He said, I don't sleep well. But his sermon was on sleep and on rest. But he he said he doesn't sleep well. He's a terrible sleeper. But he's actually very good at resting. And he's figured out what it means to rest in the Lord, not to be, to, to have peace in him during his day and during his life and in his calling and what the Lord has called him to do. Even if he doesn't sleep so great at night, He is resting in his walk with the Lord. So we will explore that a little bit. I think at one point, I wasn't sleeping so well. I had a low point in my life, and and it was then I realized we spend a third of our lives sleeping. Why don't I buy a few books and read about sleep and learn about sleep a little bit? And uh, one of the books in particular I liked, and so I will... Uh, share some of the points from that book this morning. Uh, explore that. When I was having trouble sleeping uh, a few years ago, I, was, I got to the point where I was using sleeping pills a fair amount. Uh, and I realized that I had grown in a little bit of a dependence on these sleeping pills. If I was going to get, uh, if I was going to sleep that night, and it wasn't every night, but, but from time to time, I would, instead of trusting in the Lord or whatever, I would just trust in these pills to help me go to sleep. And so I realized, I don't think that that is what the Lord wants for me. He wants me to, de- to rely on Him only, uh, whether I'm awake or whether I'm asleep. And so, uh, so I, I changed that. And one thing in particular was on Sunday nights, I wasn't sleeping very well. And so I thought that, well, I, must, I had a nice relaxing weekend and now I'm stressed about the week to come. And so that's what gives me this anxiety on Sunday nights and makes it more difficult for me to get to sleep. But then in reading through this book, I figured out that actually sleepless Sundays are a very common occurrence. And it's not because you're stressed about the week to come. It's actually something different. So I will share that with you in a minute. Uh, another thing I'm not really going to talk about a whole lot today, and that's dreams. I don't, I'm not an expert on dreams. I haven't figured it out, but I think, you know, maybe I'm being a bad steward of the dreams that God gives me. But I know in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God did pe- speak to people through dreams. And so I think that's another way we could be abiding in God day and night. But I'm not an expert on that, so we're not going to go into that. Next slide, please. So first, let's talk about rest and what it means to rest. Then I'm going to go through some some basics on sleep from the Bible, from this other book that I've read. Um, And 
talk about sleeping versus worrying, and uh, and then fulfillment. And so, what's what do we get? What's the benefit when we are abiding in God and we have the contentment and the fulfillment that He wants from us? Next slide. In Genesis two. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So do you think God in all of his power, he spoke the universe into being, he spoke the earth into being, he created man with his words, he created all the animals, everything of the earth, you think he was tired? God is the almighty God. He, speaking a universe or two into being, I don't think that makes him tired. I don't think he's like us and he's weak uh, in his flesh and he needs to rest on the seventh day in order to recoup. I don't think that's his situation. But he still chose to rest. And on our first day, the sixth day of the week, was actually our first day, if I'm not mistaken. And then on the seventh day, at the beginning of our week, is when he gave for us to rest. So actually, we probably weren't tired in our flesh either. But we were able to start from a position of rest and come into this world from a position of rest. And God wants us to stay in that rest. This next verse, Matthew 11. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I've met people who, were their salvation story, they're coming to a relationship with Christ. This verse was a key part of that testimony, a key part of what, why they started to yearn for Christ, why they started to realize that they were not that they were weary and burdened, but they wanted the peace, the rest, the love, the goodness that Jesus offered. Is there anybody here who that was a key verse in their salvation? Maybe not. But it is such an encouraging verse to us, isn't it? If we can imagine giving all of our burden from the days, all of our sickness, all of our worries, all of the death around us, all of the expectations of other people on our lives, all of the pressures, if we give that entirely to him and we have such a light burden, such an easy yoke, that we put it on Christ who loves us. He is gentle, He is humble in heart. He cares for us. He wants, he's glad to take our burdens onto him. And we have such freedom. And we want to share that freedom and that peace and that goodness with other people around us. Another verse, the next verse that's been encouraging to me the last couple of years is this one from Isaiah 30. I shared it last time I spoke as well. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. So we think that the way for us to accomplish things, the way for us to be saved, the way for us to live and do what Christ wants us to do is out of our strength and out of moving forward and out of uh, doing great things for Christ. 
But it's not. He says here our salvation comes from repentance and from rest, from turning away. Repentance is turning away from the evil in our lives, from the evil in our heart. Rest is just giving that to him. It's having his peace and walking slowly with him as he leads us step by step what we should do. In quietness and in trust is our strength. Our strength doesn't come from uh, worldly, earthly strength. But it comes from quietness and trusting in him that he will guide us. Unfortunately, Israel... Isaiah says here, but you would have none of it. Israel wasn't walking in that quietness, in that repentance, in that rest. But that's where God wants us. So what is it that instead we choose, what is it that we're striving for? What is it that we, next slide, what is it that we, are working for? What is it that our hope, that our lives are pointing for, are, are striving for? This verse from James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. We covet. We want the things that our neighbor has. We, we want these things of the, world. We, of the world. We want nicer houses, bigger cars, nicer clothes. We want respect. We want uh, nice vacations to go on. We want the things of the world. Those are the desires in our heart. What does it say about it? You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So somehow when we pray to God, when we ask for something, we're praying and we're, we're asking because our motives are wrong. In what way are they wrong? That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. We want nice food, we want to go to restaurants, our stomach and our hearts are filled with greed and selfishness. It's all, what can we do for ourselves? And that is the natural, those are the natural desires that man has. We are inherently selfish and we want things for ourselves. So we can spend what we get on our pleasures. You adulterous people. We're adulterous because we are forsaking that one relationship with God that he wants us to have. And we're putting ourselves, our pleasures, our finances, our, our respect, other people's respect for us, ahead of our relationship with God and with Christ. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? So by, by desiring all those things, by putting this world and all of our accomplishments, all of our selfishness ahead of God, we are becoming enemies with God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So that is the evil, that is the darkness, that is the selfishness that we start with and that we are born with. But fortunately, uh, there's hope. And we can put our hope, we can put our desires, we can change, we can renew our minds and put our desires in a better place. So back to sleep. Let's talk about sleep. Some basics in sleep. And so this selfishness, how is that going to affect, it affects our daytime, how is it going to affect our sleep as well? In Psalm 4, next slide. Psalm 4, 
Verse 8, In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So it's only God. It's not that our finances, it's not that uh, something else can bring us safety, can give us sweet sleep. But it's God alone that can give us sweet sleep. Next slide. The theologian R.C. Sproul, he said this, If I thought even for one moment that a simple molecule were running loose in the universe outside of the control and domain of an almighty God, I wouldn't sleep tonight. Even if a single molecule were running loose in the universe outside the control and the domain of an almighty God, I wouldn't sleep tonight. God is in control of everything going on in our lives. Our friend's death, uh, our parents' cancer, or things in our own life, God is in control of that, and he can allow us peace during the daytime, during the nighttime, all the time. Next slide. So this is from the, uh, from the book on sleep. You can see it up there. It says, good night, Say Goodnight to Insomnia by Dr. Jacobs, a Harvard doctor. And it's a six-week solution. It, in the book, it gives you six weeks, step by step, on how to get your sleep going better and helping you think through things and, and has some worksheets uh, to help go in. One of the basics it talks about, which was uh, helpful for me to learn, was these cycles that we have during sleep. So we start off uh, up there at the top, at the beta sleep, as we start falling asleep at night. And then we go down into deep sleep. Delta would be deep sleep. And then every hour and a half or so, every hour or so, we go through a cycle. And we come up, and up at the top is our lighter sleep, our shallower sleep. When we're more easily awoken, sometimes we do actually wake up a little bit or fully. And that's our, and then we go back into deep sleep and come back up. REM sleep is rapid eye movement. It's when your eyes are moving around a lot. That's actually your dream sleep. You might have thought dream sleep was your deep sleep. It's not. It's actually your shallow sleep is when we're in dream, as we're in uh, dream mode. So, a little basic about sleep. Next slide. Ashton spoke a couple of weeks ago and he got to share. He was talking about work and he was talking about how Satan loves to trick us. He loves to deceive us. And he, instead of coming at us with lies that are completely untrue and, and obvious lies, he just twists things a little bit and makes it, makes it believable, even from Adam and Eve in the garden, when he came and he, uh, deceived, he tricked Eve and he tricked Adam, and he told them, uh, he got them to eat the fruit. He didn't come out with a blatant lie, but he twisted the truth just a little bit and got them to take the fruit. Satan is the father of lies, and he loves to trick us. He loves to lie to us. Here in John chapter 8, uh, verse 42 and 44, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but you have sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you do not want, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan loves to deceive us. He loves to lie to us. He loves to twist things and get us off. And even with sleep, he gives us lies and untruths about sleep, just like he does in all aspects of our lives. Next slide. So when I was taking uh, sleeping pills, I think I was being dependent on something other than Christ. 
Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lead on your own understanding. He doesn't want us to trust in ourselves. Our entire heart should be trusting in God. And when I was taking sleeping pills, I think um, I was uh, trusting in those pills to help me get to sleep. I'm thankful that uh, that uh, I don't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, I am taking sleeping pills right now because I am just doing jet lag. And so I think it really helps me uh, in my jet lag to take some sleeping pills. <laughs> but anyways, there's a time and a place. That's right, Sue. Thank you. Um, but, next slide. Another lie that I believed was that I needed nine hours of sleep. Many people may think, yeah, I really need whatever it is. Maybe I need eight hours of sleep or I need eight and a half hours of sleep. I need X, X number of hours of sleep. The Bible says, Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. That our strength actually to function through the day doesn't come from the number of hours we slept the night before. Our strength comes from God. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the strength. And so that's very encouraging for me. Um, at night, if I'm, having a, if I'm having trouble sleeping one night, to think tomorrow, whatever it is that I need to do, God is going to give me the strength and the power that I need to get through the day. So last night, I was starting to wake up. I'm jet lagged, as can be. It's, it's, it's nighttime right now for me. But, and last night I was trying to sleep and it was daytime for me. And I started to wake up in the middle of the night and I was starting to worry, oh no, I've got to preach tomorrow. Is it, gonna, is it going to, am I going to be so tired and, I, and I'm going to be falling asleep and everybody's going to fall asleep? Or what? But I was able to quiet my mind, thank you, Jesus, and was able to say, you know, even if I do, if I do wake up, if I'm up from 2 o'clock all day long, the Lord will give me the strength that I need to be able to share his message and his truth today. And so, uh, thank, thank the Lord I went back to sleep. Um, but God is good. So, you know, this, this lie that we think we need eight hours, whatever it is, uh, seven hours, whatever we think we need in order to feel rested the next day, what, the, what this book talks about is that's not actually true. Next slide. We get our core sleep in those first two cycles. So if you've gotten four hours, if you've gotten five, five and a half hours, then you've already been through these, this deep sleep. The deep sleep is the most refreshing sleep for our bodies, according to this Harvard doctor. And... Um, so if we can get through those first two cycles of sleep, then we've gotten basically what we need uh, to have basic performance and to be able to perform our normal functions at work or whatever. Um, and he tells some stories. The world record holder went 11 consecutive days without any sleep. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was not very pleasant to be around, but he was able to function. He was able to carry out his, his normal duties. He talks about neurosurgeons who, especially during their residency in their studies, they are working, uh, I don't remember, I think they get four or five hours of sleep a night, but they're still able to perform brain surgery. Uh, during, during the day and during their work. It talks about transatlantic sail sailors who are on a one-man boat sailing across the Atlantic and how they, they, their, their best strategy is to sleep for 30 minutes at a time because while you're asleep, then your boat just kind of goes nowhere and goes in the wrong direction. But to take these naps 30 minutes at a time 
and, and other examples like this of how some people are able to function their main function the guy who slept who didn't go with sleep for 11 days then at the end of it he got 15 hours and he was good he didn't have to recoup all the lost sleep but after 15 hours he was able to function well and so and it, there are some tolls we after, after we get less sleep we are more easily uh, irritated agitated and we're also less able to do some critical creative thinking or things like that but for our basic performance we are still okay um, so there's there's these lies that we believe and there's these untruths that we believe and even more and they're not true but even more than that God is the is our provider and he is our strength next slide in the book he calls them negative sleep thoughts and I think of them more as lies about sleep so these are some negative sleep thoughts that we can have come to us there's there's typically there's two different types of people who struggle with sleep some have trouble going to sleep I'm more in that category others have trouble waking up in the middle of the night and then falling back to sleep uh, which I can have that sometimes as well but I'm more of the first type so uh, a few negative sleep thoughts I don't think I can fall back to sleep or I can't I can't fall asleep without a sleeping pill another one is oh no this is going to be another night of insomnia or my insomnia is getting worse I need more sleep or oh no I'm awake those are some negative sleep thoughts some lies about sleep but if we can reinforce the truths if we can reinforce some positive sleep thoughts I always fall asleep I always fall back to sleep sooner or later what happens when we have these negative thoughts is then we start getting nervous and as we get more nervous we start getting more and more awake and we're dreading it and then we try to fall back to sleep and then we're just getting more and more excited and less and less asleep but if we can calm ourselves down and have peace and not be so anxious about it not be so worried about it then it actually becomes much easier to fall asleep I need less another positive sleep thought is I need less sleep than I thought my sleep is getting better and better if I get my core sleep I'll be able to function during the day God is in control of my situation and I don't need to worry so much sometimes it's all those thoughts about work or thoughts about what we're trying to achieve or thoughts about a relationship with our family or whatever it is that are getting us worried and upset and that we keep thinking about when we're supposed to be sleeping if we can give that over to God the Harvard doctor he did say it was kind of a footnote I don't think he's very religious himself I'm guessing but he did say if you can get some religion that's a good idea because it will uh, help you in your sleep uh, and I wouldn't recommend just some religion I would recommend some Jesus God will give me the strength I need tomorrow to function next slide and so here as we go through some basics about sleep uh, these are some of the best practices from the book so it's just some practical advice from the book uh, one thing that's been I think huge for me is a consistent sleep time and so if we're able to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night or midnight or whatever it is if you can be consistent about that and then waking up consistent as well I used to think it was good to sleep in on the weekends but actually when I, I mentioned the sleepless Sundays that was caused because I was sleeping in on the weekends and so our bodies we have this it's called a circadian rhythm and our body temperature goes up and down and it has to do with the sunlight and things like this but if we can keep that rhythm consistent and now I go to bed 10 10 30 every 
every uh, night and I wake up 7 o'clock without a, an alarm, uh, and that consistency has been so helpful. Um, whereas my sleepless Sundays were being caused because on Saturday morning and then on Sunday morning I was sleeping in, and so on Sunday night I just wasn't sleepy yet. My body wasn't ready to go to bed, and I thought I was all worried about the week, but no, it was actually caused by this rhythm that I wasn't aware of. So just a practical tip. Another one is cooler temperatures. Our bodies sleep better, and part of sleep, part of that rhythm has to do with your body temperature, and the cooler temperature actually helps you go, go to sleep. To avoid stimulation, if, if our beds are a place where we play games, or we read books, or we watch TV, or we surf and do Facebook, or whatever it is, then our bed becomes a cue for those types of emotional uh, stimulation. But if we save our bed uh, for sleep uh, and, uh, and less of these other activities, then that's a much better way to have bed be a cue for, um, for sleeping. A and that's what it means by bedroom activities. What you're doing in your bed, save your work, save your, your Facebook or whatever, TV, watching the news, all these other stimulating things, save that for a different place, a different time. Um, and, and then have a sort of a rhythm uh, and, and after nine o'clock, don't be doing work. Don't be doing uh, other things that will get your mind going. Exercise is a good thing. I'm not good enough at that, but having some good exercise during the day makes you sufficiently tired, makes your body uh, e eager to get some rest. Darkness in your room uh, is important. Having a comfortable bed, a comfortable pillow. And another thing is napping. If we are getting too much sleep during the day, or if we're taking a Sunday nap, then that also can cause the Sunday evening restlessness. Uh, so being careful with our napping. If you're napping during church, that's not a good idea either. <laughs> Next slide. So those were kind of some practical tips, but let's dive in, dive in a little bit to sleep versus worry and the peace that God gives us. Next slide. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Proverbs 3.24. Uh, so God does talk about, the Bible does talk about giving us good rest. Next slide. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. So this also, Ecclesiastes, this is from Solomon, just like the Proverbs. The Proverbs, they're not true in each and every situation, are they? But they're general truths. They have truths that apply in general to our lives and, our guide, and give us guidelines. What is this trying to get out? The rich, does it mean that no rich person is going to have good sleep? It doesn't mean that necessarily, but there's a deeper principle there that we can uncover. The, the sleep of a laborer. The laborer is doing physical work. He's getting exercise. He has his struggles too in his mind. He worries about paying the bills. He worries about paying his electricity bill or his water bill or having enough food to eat. But he also has some good physical labor that he's done to make him tired. The rich, in their abundance, they've got bills to pay too. He, the, a rich guy may have a hundred factories that he has to run. He has to pay the rent. He's worried about paying his bills too. But what is it that makes the rich person worry more in this circumstance? Next slide. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. So are we working too hard? Are we, have we got the right life balance? 
Are we working? Do we think that our success, that what we're able to achieve comes from rising early and staying up too late? For toiling for food to eat? God loves us. He, he allows us to have boundaries on our life and not to push it to the limits too much. He wants us to have peace. He wants to provide for us, provide our food. We don't have to work so hard to earn it. And he will provide, he will grant sleep to those he loves as well. On the next slide, but so often it's the evil desires. This is the same verse in James we looked at a minute ago, where it's these evil desires within us, where it's our selfishness that is driving us to want more and more and to not give up in our work and to not put boundaries on all of our, on all of our work. Um, even, for example, the pastor of a church, he may not be striving to earn more and more money, right? But he's striving because he wants people to respect him. He, he, he is looking to man, to the people around him, to tell him how, worth, how worthwhile he is. Instead of just following God and and God allows him to, and guides his step and shows him how much work he should be doing in the congregation. For example, uh, or for a business person, or for a student who's working so hard to try to achieve the grades, well, maybe you've got to put some boundaries on that and step back a little bit. If we don't, if we're working too hard, if we're striving too hard, we can get stressed out and be so worried about all these different things and have bad habits, be stressed. And that's not going to help us in our sleep. It's not going to help us in our daytime either. But there is a balance there. This verse, the next verse in Proverbs says, Do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake, and you will have food to spare. So it's not, we can't go overboard and just sleep all the time. We have to to strike the right balance there. And the Bible talks about that as well. Next slide. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, Deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. So again, it's talking about the evil desires. We want these pleasures, what what it is we're striving for in our lives. And we have envy. We're looking at others and seeing what they have and what the Lord has blessed them with. And we want that for ourselves. But when the kindness and love of of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Next slide. (coughs) And so he tells us in, um, in Luke 12, Do not worry. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. He will provide all these things for us. He loves us. He will give us our food. He will give us our clothes. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? So we we tend to worry, we get stressed. But God is saying, don't worry. He's commanding us not to worry. He's saying he will provide for us. 
and do not set your heart on what you eat or on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom. That's what he wants us to do. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Somehow we can be saving up our treasures in heaven, putting it up there. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if we can somehow figure out to get our treasures, and so we're not coveting these evil desires that we're talking about. We're pursuing the things of this world. We're coveting what our neighbor has. But instead of working for those, if we can figure out how to save our treasures into heaven, and our heart will follow where our treasure's going. The next slide in John 14, he says, Peace I live with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He is, in his mercy, he gives us peace. He gives us uh, the ability not to worry. That he will provide for us. He will give us whatever it is that we need on this earth. And we can walk with him and trust him. Not be afraid. The next slide. John chapter 14 He says, I am the way. I've been thinking about that. This verse has been an encouragement for me lately. In the beginning, after Christ uh, died, rose again, the Christians, they didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves followers of the way. Christianity was called the way. And I'm so thankful for the Lord in my life. I grew up in a... a, uh, well-to-do part of Dallas, Texas. And in my high school, I was back there this week, and, and many of the young kids drove BMWs uh, or nice cars. Uh, there's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of alcohol. Uh, money is not something that many of them lack. And if it wasn't for God working in my life, I probably would have gone the same way. I probably... Uh, would have all sorts of drug problems and been trapped in the world of of financial success. Um, but, But God has saved me. And I was born into a Christian family. And when I was 18, I came to a personal relationship with Christ in college. And he's given me a different way of life than many of my classmates and many of the other people around me, and I'm so thankful for that. And uh, I hope that anybody here today that that doesn't yet know Christ in that way can have a a new way as well, and a new walk with him, and and figure out what it is that this life means. Um, So, amen. Next slide. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So as we abide in God, as we uh, hang out with God, as we are in relationship with Jesus, whether it's daytime, whether it's nighttime, he will guide us. He will give us his peace. He will give us what we need. And... If we're not in him, then we can't bear fruit. We can do nothing. And we will be cut off. 
but he prunes us, he fixes us, he disciplines us. He gives us challenges, he gives us opportunities to trust in him, not to worry, but to trust in him. The next slide, and the next slide. Next. I was at a uh, prayer time with some guys, and we were praising and worshiping, and I got into a small group with another brother, and so we were each praying for each other, and he said the one thing that he wanted to pray for was for the will of God in his life. And over and over he prayed, and he just prayed, God, I want your will in my life. I want your will in my life. I want your will in my life. And so I, that's been very encouraging to me lately. And my, the porch at my house looks out over the ocean. And I can go, and I can stand there and look out over the ocean and say, Lord, I want your will in my life. I want your will in my life. I want your will in my life. And it's not that I want you know, all the things, all my own dreams, all of what I want to achieve. I want to put that aside and say, Lord, I want your will in my life. And I look in, it's like looking over the horizon, over the ocean. It's like looking into the future and just saying, Lord, whatever my dreams are, whatever my visions are for my future, I'm taking that away, I'm putting it down, and I want your will for my life. And it's a very healthy exercise of, uh, of dying to self and of taking up his calling and looking for his guidance on my life. There's a new worship song that I like um, where it talks about the death of cross and that uh, the death of Christ on the cross in that moment when he was dying, when he was sacrificing his life, when he was giving up everything and allowing here the, the king of the universe was allowing these sinners to kill him and to suffer and to ridicule him in that moment. Lord, that, me, that we may take that moment and have it live day by day in our hearts so that our entire life may be that moment carried on in our sacrifice. And so as we look over the ocean to the horizon and say, Lord, I want your will in my life, that that sacrifice, that moment is being carried forward today and into the future uh, in my life. Next slide. But on the other hand, um, On the other hand, you know, sometimes we have our own dreams and we want our own things in our life. Maybe we're dreaming, oh, this weekend, or oh, uh, when I retire, or whatever it is, I want to go. And this pastor, I heard he was talking about this place in America called Montana. And I want to go to Montana. Montana is up in the north, close to Canada. And there's not many people that live there. Uh, do we have anybody from Montana this morning? Oh, we do. Oh, good. Oh, good. I hear it's beautiful. Is that right? Oh, good. And not many people there. Not like Shaman. But, so we may dream in our hearts, oh, if I could only retire, or if I could only have this vacation in Montana, if I could buy a house up by this river in the forest, on the edge of the mountains. And there I would find peace. And there I would be happy. I just can't wait for that. And if we're putting our hope, if we're putting our desires in that, then what happens is we have this discontent where we are right now. And we're so frustrated by all the people, by all the relationships, by all the stuff going on in our lives today. And that discontent grows. But then what happens when you get there to Montana 
is you still have this chaos in your heart because you get to Montana and you sit there on the porch by the river, but you're still not content. There's still this chaos going on in your heart and this frustration of what of what you're still longing for. But it's only Christ. It's only the peace that he gives. It's only his life in our hearts that can deliver what it is we're looking for. Montana can't do it for us. <laughs> it's still, it's, and I haven't figured it out. It's still something I'm struggling with. I do like... Uh, on the weekends, I do like going to the countryside, and I don't know if that's if that's if that's good or not. I haven't figured it out. Um, a couple weekends ago, I was trying to decide, Lord, do you want me to go to this orphanage, this this other orphanage that we discovered, and take my family there, and we can serve together this Saturday? Uh, and I was wrestling with it, but. Uh, but I felt that he was telling me, no, I've been, I, you've, you haven't spent enough time with your kids this week. I think it's better if you guys just go and have fun in the countryside. And so, and so we did. But it is this struggle, and, I'm, and I haven't figured out the answer. How much in America, so much of our lives are spent in entertainment and in looking for, for pleasures and in wasting time almost. But... I think much of the time the Lord wants us to be more purposeful with our time and more purposeful in reaching out to others and loving other people. So I haven't figured it out yet, but that's, some, that's a balance. That's something that we need to work on. Is how much... Is, is some entertainment okay? Is some relaxation okay? I think so. But then also, how can we be purposefully loving and reaching out to others? But... Montana should not be the, the single hope and desire that we are focused on. We need to focus on the Lord. Put our hope in the Lord. Wait on Him. And He will be uh, our provider. Next slide. So lastly, let's look at the opposite of being worried. The opposite of being unfulfilled. To be fulfilled. To have contentment to have joy that he wants to give us. Next slide, Philippians 4. It says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So Paul, the apostle who traveled to so many parts of the world, was in prisons. Uh, he says, I know what it is to be in want and what it is to have plenty, but he has found the secret of being content. And in Christ, he can go through any of those situations and still be content and still have plenty in the Lord. And so that is where we want to be. We want to be, whether we're in Montana, whether we're in Shaman, whether we're in New York City or in Africa, Lord, that we could be content in his provision for us. Back to Matthew 11, the next slide. Come to me, all who are worried, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Montana cannot take away all of our burdens. And Montana is not where we are trying to go. We are sojourners in this world. Even for our brothers and sisters from Montana, that is not their home. Heaven is our home. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope, our joy comes from that we know that our names are written in heaven. In Luke 10, after Jesus sent out the 72, they, they came back and they were so excited. They said, Lord, we've cast out demons. We've been victorious. People are 
obeying your name. It works, Lord. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in these things. He says, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. So it's not our earthly successes. It's not even our spiritual earthly successes that bring us fulfillment. Our hope comes from our name being written in heaven, from the relationship with him that we can enjoy in the future and today as we worship, as we come together and encourage one another, as we sing worship songs, as we communion, as we enjoy God's presence, worshiping him. That's as good as it gets. So in closing, the the last slide, this is, uh, I did this, a, a similar sermon in 2009. So my boy, he's now 10. Uh, he was probably three. And at night, we would pray before he went to bed. He didn't really understand the word pray, but he knew what it meant to talk to Jesus. And so as we talk to Jesus, these are some helpful things to pray about as we're going to sleep at night. And they remind us to trust in him. So we say, thank you, Jesus, for giving us time to rest. Help us rely on you for strength tomorrow. So these are just some ideas as you pray at night. Maybe remember one or two of these and say it in your prayer. Help us put tomorrow in your hands and not worry. Help us be well rested if that's your will, if that's your will to strengthen us as we serve you tomorrow. Help us to stay tuned into you during sleep and be open to relationship and communication with you, whether we are awake or asleep. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to think about your presence with us, Lord, throughout our waking hours, throughout our evenings, our nights. Lord, we ask that you would give us more and more joy in our relationship with you, Lord. That we would have more and more hope in this relationship, in our eternal salvation in you, Lord. Lord, that you would carry us through each day. Lord, that you would provide for our needs and help us not to worry about what's going to happen. Lord, help us to have joy that comes from your approval of us. Lord, that we we would not be fear of what, afraid of what others think of us. (coughs) Lord, (coughs) thank you for today and for uh, this afternoon we get to have fellowship with one another and go before us in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.